You're you're not actually from Marin County. Where where, where are you where, where did you grow up? Where... I grew up in Bergen County, New Jersey, which is just across the river from Manhattan, actually Yonkers on the on the north side of Manhattan. And um, when I grew up, there were some open spaces, but I really didn't grow up around much open space and there were no mountains where I grew up and I got out of there and I moved to California uh, when I was uh, 17 and uh, I came to San Francisco and my friends would take me to Mount Tamalpais sometimes for hikes and it was this exotic amazing huge mountain I had never really experienced anything like it I, I had been to Vermont but I had never been to the mountains in the Rockies or any real mountains. So Mount Tam to me was a really big mountain and it was so close. If someone had a car that they borrowed from somebody, we could head up here for the day. And I had such a great time hiking around. And I lived in San Francisco for 19 years and was really lucky to come out here whenever I could. And I discovered Tennessee Valley at some point. My wife and I would hike there all the time when we could. And finally, we got so fed up with the fog in the Richmond district of San Francisco that we said, we're, we're moving to Marin County. And if there's any way we can get to Mill Valley in Mount Tam, that's where we want to live. And that was in 1997. And the real estate market had slumped just enough for us to be able to afford to get into Mill Valley. And we were right at the foot of Mount Tam and at the bottom of all these hiking trails. And uh, I just started hiking all the time on the mountain. And I felt like every new trail I discovered was this uncharted territory that only I had found. And I got to the point where after five or six years, I had hiked the entire south side of the mountain, pretty much every trail that's in Barry Spitz's book. And I started to experiment with north side trails. And uh, here we are actually on the north side. And to me, the north side was the wild side of Mount Tam. And having this place that I didn't know was this incredible gift and, uh, and when I felt like I needed to get away from civilization, I would just go to one of the north side trails. Specifically, I'd park at the mountain uh, theater parking lot, the overflow parking lot. I'd take the Lagunitas Fire Road up to the rifle camp, and that's where the north side trail started, which would go to Collier Spring and, and down to Inspiration Point down there. And, uh, and that's how I could get away from the world. You couldn't hear any road noise. Well, one day, I don't know, it was uh, maybe 10 years ago, I was at the rifle camp and instead of going on the north side trail, I went up the Arturo Trail. And it led me to these ruins that I didn't, I had never seen before, I didn't know anything about before. And I, I of course had seen the golf ball on top of Tam forever. In fact, when I moved here in 1978, there were two domes on Tam. And I remembered there were two and then all of a sudden there was one, but I didn't know that there was anything else ever up here. So I stumbled across these ruins at the top of the mountain, I really had no idea what they were until I went out the main gate and saw this sign that said Mill Valley Air Force Station. And we were right under the big white ray dome and, and I couldn't understand why there were these fenced off ruins on top of this mountain. And it, it seemed like this vast expanse of ruins. It was really only 20 or 30 acres. But when I discovered them, I, 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 I was lost in this feeling of what had gone on here that would lead this place to be left in such a state? And that was about 10 years ago. And over time, when it was very foggy down below, I'd come up to the top of the mountain and very frequently I would end up in the ruins and wander around. And I started to do little Google searches on the Mill Valley Air Force Station. I found there were very few bits of information about it. and. Uh, it was just this kind of secondary thing that was always percolating in my mind. And four years ago, I was very lucky to become a volunteer fire lookout up on East Peak. And I spent a lot of time driving past the Air Force Station on my way to the fire lookout. And I hadn't done any filmmaking, although I had been a photographer my whole life. I had never been a filmmaker. I had made tools for filmmakers for 20 years, specifically computer animation, visual effects tools, so people could visualize things that were too small or too large or too fast or too slow to show with conventional cinematography. So I was really aware of these techniques that were used to present these physical phenomenon in ways that were understandable to real people. 
And so I, I, had, I had made tools for filmmakers. I had never done any filmmaking. My cameras weren't capable of making films, but I did buy a little point and shoot that had a time-lapse mode in it four years ago, a little Canon S95. And I made a little film from the fire lookout that year in 2010 to show my friends and my family how beautiful the fog was, especially in the evening, how it rolled in over the hills. And, and I loved doing that and I loved sharing it. And in 2011, I had a little camcorder that I bought. I went to the next level. I bought a little Canon XF100 camcorder and I, I made my first little day in the life of a fire lookout test. And it was great, but it, it didn't show any of the nighttime and the really magical period of time up here on the mountain where when everyone else leaves the mountain and you're all by yourself and you just hear the crickets in the wind and seven million people are below you, but you're apart from everything. It's this very mystical, spiritual time. And I wanted to share that with people, so I needed to buy new camera equipment that I could uh, use for astrophotography to capture what it's like at night. And in, in 2012, I bought some new equipment. I bought some motorized equipment so I could, I could use this animated feeling of parallax with foreground and background objects moving at different rates to be more immersive for people who would see it. And I made a seven minute film called A Day in the Life of a Fire Lookout, which was really well received. People are fascinated by fire lookouts in the first place because uh, there's a lot of romanticism. Uh, you know, Jack Kerouac had been a fire lookout and Gary Snyder, and uh, it's this very meditative, isolated uh, activity. And, and so there was that. And then also people had never seen really what the top of the mountain looks like at night because unless you're breaking the law, you're not allowed to be here. So. I got a chance to show people something that they had never seen. And also, my work with Marin County Fire was really rewarding because at the time, our fire lookout program was very unsubscribed. We only had about 50% of the people we needed to fully man the lookout. And when I talked to my supervisor, Don Keelan, about making this film, we thought, wow, if we do something that's really exciting enough, perhaps we'll get some more lookouts. So in some ways, it was a recruitment film for the Fire Lookout program. And it worked out spectacularly, and now we have a huge waiting list. Uh, we're, we have 30 lookouts, and the waiting list is at least that long or longer. And uh, so that worked out great. And when the, uh, Nels Johnson, the reporter for the IJ, asked me uh, what my next film was going to be about, I really had no idea, because I was only just beginning to see myself as a filmmaker. Uh, because I had made this little thing and I wanted to do more of that because it was just so much fun. And I, and I told him that I had uh, this, real, uh, this, this real drive to understand what had happened up at the West Peak because it had been obviously desecrated. And I had heard this rumor that there were 40 feet blown off the top of the mountain. And I made a joke to him saying, we ought to make t-shirts that say we want our 40 feet back and, uh, and start a movement in Marin County to do something about that, uh, that spot. And he printed it in the article in the IJ in, in uh, 2012. And at that point I was kind of committed because I had told him I was interested in doing it. It was in the newspaper and, and I started making a documentary. And I had never made a documentary before. So of course the first thing I did was watch all the Ken Burns documentaries again and uh, study how he, structured them and I took notes and I outlined his structure which is actually very repeatable and I thought well you know I could probably do that and I started putting the word out asking for people who had maybe been stationed up here or knew anything about the place and I started bringing my equipment up here and I bought some new more elaborate time-lapse motion control equipment and another camera so I could run two shots simultaneously because the time-lapse thing is very tricky because what you're really shooting is the weather more than anything else because that's what's moving. Besides the camera moving on a track, which is not that interesting, what's really interesting is the weather. And this was the winter of 2013, which was the driest winter, the least cloudy winter in history. And I had embarked on a project that required clouds. And so I became a bit of an amateur meteorologist, got very intimate with all the terms on the NOAA weather site, and uh, would wake up at four o'clock every morning and roll over and look at the iPad and see 
what was going on today, whether or not that was a shooting day. And if the weather was good, I would need both of those rigs in order to capture as much footage as I could before the clouds went away. So I, I started doing tests for a possible documentary. And of course, not everyone can come up here with a whole bunch of motion control gear and animation equipment and uh, all the things that you needed to do to create a documentary without a permit. And, and so I contacted the water district to see if they'd be interested in supporting me with a permit. And I found out that it was a major goal of the water district to raise awareness of this site because they were in the process of putting together a collaboration between all the stakeholders on the mountain, forming the Tamalpais Lands Collaborative to do these kinds of restoration projects because they're so expensive and no one agency had the money to do it. And, and so, so I, I, I was very fortunate to talk with Mike Sweezy, who's the manager of the watershed here. He's the man in charge of the entire mountain. I don't know if most, most people know that at least the north side and most of the south side is, is, his, is his responsibility. And he was thrilled. He gave me a, a, a permit to shoot up here for six months and a key so I could get into the station with all of my gear. And I finished my testing phase and I started shooting in earnest and doing research on, on who could tell me something about this place. And after about uh, a month and a half of shooting and doing research, I realized that I was going to need a really strong person to narrate this documentary in order to give it life. And uh, I, I had known that Peter Coyote lived in Mill Valley. And of course, he had narrated so many of the Ken Burns documentaries and so many other things that I thought, wow, this would be the perfect person to do it. I, I knew about all the work that he had done to support causes that were important to environmentalists. And I thought he might be interested. So I just contacted him out of the blue and he was in love with the idea. He just, he was so enthusiastic about it. And he said, not only, he said, Gary, not only do I want to help you with narrating this project, but I'd like to help write the script, which was an incredible gift because I am not a writer. I had never written a script. And, and so we would meet regularly and talk about how we wanted to bring the community into this film. So everyone felt like they had a, a stake in this piece of the mountain. In fact, one of Peter's original ideas was that this film could be almost called Children of the Mountain because we're all children of the mountain and we should be here to support it. Very few people know that Mount Tamalpais is in a, in a slow decline because it's being loved to death without the funds necessary to do all the maintenance and restoration work. And that's what the Tamalpais Lands Collaborative is all about. So Peter helped me pull all these themes together and then in April when I had, I had a bunch of interviews under my belt, I had uh, been doing historical, uh, historical research, I had uh, asked a friend of mine, Jamie Clay, to reconstruct the original mountain in 3D in uh, AutoCAD and, and 3D Studio Max to show people what it looked like originally and how much of it really got removed. And I had all these assets and then I asked my friend George Daly, who was a great musical composer and an executive in the music industry for many, many decades, if he would help me do the score. And as it turned out, he was also a really great writer. And so George came into the team with me and Peter as script writers. And, and George said that he would be willing to help me co-direct and co-edit the piece. And I always felt that having someone else to work with to create this kind of creative tension is is a highly synergistic thing to do it makes things much easier it makes it possible to create a, a result which is much greater than what i could do myself um, you know unless you're a really amazing auteur it's really hard to do everything yourself so i had this team now i had i had george and peter and jamie and me and uh in in june when we finished shooting we it we just started doing post-production and writing the script and it all came together fairly easily and uh, and we had it done pretty much by November, December and by that time the Tamalpais Lands Collaborative had just been on the verge of forming and we scheduled a date in February for the 
premiere at the Throckmorton Theater, and it was a sold out premiere. It sold out in three days. We could have sold three or four nights solid at the theater and had no idea what the interest would be in this film because everyone loves the mountain and everybody wants to find out how they can help. And so the premiere happened and the Lands Collaborative signed their Memorandum of Understanding, creating this first ever federal, state, and county agency to take care of a watershed in the history of the United States. And they have been very carefully laying the foundation for a process which will bring the community together to study what we can do up at the West Peak. You know, the envelope, the bookends of, of how much restoration work needs to be done. And there's going to be design charrettes where groups of people are on the mountain with engineers walking around discussing things. And then there's going to be at least six or eight guided hikes where people from the Tamalpais Conservation Club and the Alpine Club and the Friends of Mount Tam, people from the community are, are brought by me and other people around to, through the entire site on tours. And then there's going to be a series of town hall style community meetings to discuss those results and the results of the geologic and hydrologic engineers who study the place. And by the end of this process, we will have a community agreement about how we can clean the place up, how much we need to do. And, and then the National Parks Conservancy can start raising the millions of dollars necessary to make it happen. So it's just been this incredibly satisfying process for me coming from a place where I, I was not a filmmaker at all. And I just wanted to show my family and my friends how beautiful it is up here. And I just kind of fell into each step of it as I wanted to show more and more and more. And uh, it, it's just so gratifying that I might be a small part of the process of making the mountain a healthier place going forward. I'm just in love with this place. I mean, you can just look around. It's where else in the country or the world is there 85 contiguous miles of open space next to an urban area? It just doesn't happen. Talk about recreation. You can reinvent yourself over and over on this mountain. It's been so healing for so many thousands and thousands of people for, you know, thousands of years. The, the, the Miwoks, of course, uh, considered this mountain their mother. And uh, it was the source of, of the water, and the water was a source of life. So, so, you know, we owe this mountain so much and, uh, and, and the community is so enthusiastic about coming together and doing the things that are necessary. Most people really don't know that the mountain is in a slow decline because it's, it's so beautiful. But uh, the Lands Collaborative is going to embark on a huge education process to, to, to give people the tools they need to understand what needs to be done.